my God. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Elise, thank you for being here on Spark TV. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I am so excited as well. We, our paths have crossed many times, I think, over the years. Um, I was actually trying to think about it before we came on, whether it was back in your Westfield days or Mm, my my past life. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But that's maybe a good place to start. So obviously you are the amazing founder of Bossy Copywriting, Um, but I would love to hear your story. So how did you get to running your own business? What's the career path? Are the businesses? What's happening? I don't really know how I got here. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. I love that. Me either. (laughs) And that's all we've got time for. No, (laughs) I feel like I've had the strangest, like I didn't know what a copywriter was until I had a copywriting studio, um, which makes me sound really terrible at my job. But basically I've always been a writer and Mm. I've always wanted that to be my career but I did not know what copywriting was or that it existed. I just assumed that I would work in magazines or something like that. Um, So I think when I was, you know, out of school, I did journalism. And then when blogging kind of took off, I was in my very early 20s. So I was a big blogger, did lots of freelance writing. um, And I thought that I would go down that path, but then, and I kind of did, I guess, but I was just working in retail and, I ended up winning like a dream job. So that's what kind of kickstarted everything. So it was this big like nationwide competition. You had to enter a blog. Um, And then I just got like through to the next round and the next round and the next round. And then with the final five, we had to do like TV appearances and like styling challenges and all sorts of things. Because I think my career has always been like this struggle between clothes or like styling and writing yeah so I feel like the Westwood job for me was a perfect combination of the two mm. um and then That's yeah right. was it like insider or something yeah the Westwood insider yeah that's it, and it was that's how I, yeah blogging cool. started there was no Instagram there was none of that mm. and the fashion blogger was like the person to be yes. um and yeah I got put in the final three and then the public had to vote for the winner and I won and I had to just like quickly quit my job and went on this crazy whirlwind ride. Um, And I was actually only meant to have the job for a year. That was the big thing. It was like, you get paid to shop and tell for a year. Um, And I ended up staying pretty much my entire twenties, but the role kind of changed over time. I just sort of became an extension of their content team or their head office team. Um, And I did media appearances. I did lots of styling. I did street style shoots. I did heaps of editorial content. Um, And then when I was kind of coming to the end of that, I started picking up like a few freelance clients here and there and a few more like freelance writing projects as well. And I would just do them on the days that I wasn't at Westfield. And then over time, I just kind of like reduced my time with Westfield every year like it was like four days three days two days, <laughs> and then I took Bossy full time and gave it a proper name and a website <laughs> so cool I love it so tell me so what does Bossy look like today if somebody wanted to work with you what are the products and services yeah it's definitely grown up a lot since then um, back then I actually offered even different services it wasn't Bossy copywriting it was Bossy creative because I offered styling and I did social media and I did copy so it was kind of like a bit more of a creative studio um and the only reason I did that I think was because yes I've always liked clothes and writing but I honestly didn't think the copywriting would take off Mm. um which kind of touches into my whole thing about niching down and why it's really important to just like pick one lane so yeah over time it eventually became bossy copywriting and then today We definitely work with a lot of clients in a whole range of industries. It's usually people that want to have a little bit more fun with their tone of voice and their copy and are willing to take a bit of a risk in order to grab the attention of their audience and kind of use creativity to sell stuff rather than just being sleazy salesmen. Um, But then we've also got a podcast now called The Bossy Type where I kind of give away like lots of bite-sized tips 
Cool. Um, and now I have a course called Bossy Copy College, and that's kind of where I'm starting to spend more of my time. But essentially, that's for people like I was at the start of my business journey who couldn't afford to hire an agency, but wanted to enter with a bang and wanted to have a business that really aligned with them. So it's kind of like my process, but the DIY version. So um, we've only had like one intake of people so far, um, but I think it's on the 1st of August, early August, I'm having like another um, another launch and I'm doing like a four-day masterclass thing. So I think now I just signed up for that actually yeah yeah everybody go and sign up to copy camp so I love doing stuff that's like yeah workshops and where I can give those people that are just starting out um basically all the tea on copywriting and tone of voice and how they can DIY without having to either spend hours staring at the screen or spend literally their life savings getting it done so yeah, it's kind of split between the client side of stuff, which has definitely grown up a little bit. And then now it's really exploring all of the courses and programs as well. Amazing. And I want to go back to, so you said um, niching down. Yeah. Uh, so when you made the move to park the styling, because mm-hmm. um, actually I didn't quite put two and two together as to when that sort of stopped because I yeah. always remembered you as the stylist as well um so why is niching down important do you think yeah niching down I feel like I need to trademark the term niching down yeah <laughs> people are so sick of me talking about it but I think it's because when I and niching down is essentially just like narrowing down so like picking yeah. either you know one customer or one service that you're really good at, or just like narrowing down what you do. So you're known for doing something really, really well, rather than diluting yourself across a whole bunch of stuff. Mm. Um, So I have tried to really build a reputation for writing really punchy, witty, fun copy. And obviously that's my niche now. So when people come to Bossy, I'm attracting like-minded people that Mm. want fun and punchy and witty copy so it really helps to kind of like attract your dream customers and your dream clients but yeah when I um ditched the other two I think it was more a case of like I'll just start with these three things because these are the three things that I was doing at Westfield and I'll just see what happens and I definitely did do a bit of the styling um and I definitely did do a bit of the social media but I think I was just really done with styling if anyone has done styling before it is so exhausting (laughs) like I just could not anymore um and writing has always been my number one and so when that started to pick up I thought why am I trying to squeeze these other two services in when they're not really lighting me up why don't I just ditch those and really go in on this copywriting thing and once I did that it kind of opened a few doors because I was able to niche down even further. Like Mm -hmm. I used my writing style as the inspiration for the brand. So I decided I was going to do bossy copywriting. And then I really just used my own personality um, to build the business. So now I feel that it's really built around me and it feels like me. Um, And I made sure the copy and the tone of voice was really aligned with my natural writing style. So yeah, everything just feels a little bit more authentic to me. And so I've just kind of like narrowed down as I've gone on. I think it's interesting though. I think that just happens as a, a business owner. You're kind of I don't think the first thing you ever do is the thing, you know, I think you do have to actually experiment a bit, figure out what customers you want to work with, what they actually want, how to talk to them. So I kind of think that that is the path to sort of sell a bunch of stuff, go, Oh, I don't really like doing that. (laughs) Yeah. You figure out what, what, not only what works and what doesn't, but what you like doing and what you don't like doing. So then you can really kind of craft, like I always think I didn't start a business to just be, you know, to just have a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. And if you're starting a business, you're at a huge advantage because you can literally build it however you want. Like I've started thinking, "Mm, it would be, would be nice to work four days a week. I could just do a four day work week. Like you could just do whatever you want. It's so amazing. It's like, I can literally design the life I want. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So even though I'm still in that phase of it, I feel like early on, I really just tried to build it around my personality and what I like and what I enjoy doing. I really like doing fun 
copy. So I thought, why wouldn't I just want to spend my days doing that instead? Yeah, that's so good. I love that because I think, I mean, I, I've said this about a thousand billion times on this podcast, but I remember, so we've been in business for like 10 years now. And I just remember getting to the kind of six, seven year mark going, oh my God, I hate this. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I was like, well, you're an idiot because you're the boss. <laughs> You can literally change it. <laughs> I know, but like, I don't know. I think that people do that. Like you build this Definitely. thing up and then you say yes to everything. Cause you're kind of like, oh my God, someone wants to pay me money. I better do it. Um, and then you kind of have that aha moment of, okay, if I'm going to yep. work my ass off, I may as well do it around the stuff that I like doing. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like I still definitely have those patches where I'm like, whoa, I have a business. Like it doesn't leave my brain. I'm constantly mm. thinking about it. It's really consuming. And there are parts where I'm not having fun anymore and I want yep. to get off the ride. Um, but those I think are good opportunities to take a step back and be like, okay, well, what can I change? Because unlike an employee, I can actually do something about it yeah totally and also like um at some point you'll get to the stage where you can outsource the shit things exactly. and I know your team has grown now as well right so you've got yeah. more, more people on the team so how what how was that process like how did you go from I'm um, doing everything to you've got an office you've got people Talk yeah through that. so I did it quite strategically because I didn't have the cash to hire a full-time team and to be honest, I'm not really keen on having a big full-time team. Like I'm not the sort of person, I love having people around me, but I don't, I'm not crazy about the idea of having like a really full agency. That's just not really my vibe. I'd like mm. to have a little bit more freedom, I think. Um, so I think when it was approaching 2020, I thought, okay, I definitely need help, mm -hmm. but I don't really want to or can afford to hire a team so what am I going to do the other thing is that I always try and think because obviously for me tone of voice and copy and branding isn't just like how you speak it's also how you act mm -hmm. so I try and make every decision on brand with bossy so I thought it's probably like a little bit too traditional to just follow that path so I started exploring like freelance writers. And so then I came up with the super group and that's basically our fun way of saying our freelance network. Cool. And I just put a job ad up for freelance writers and I got like hundreds of applications because wow. it was kind of the dream because it was just like, I'll find you the work and then I'll pay you to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but also they're not on the payroll. So it's not like you're working to fund a team. Exactly. And it meant that because copywriting is so project based, mm. even now, like I still get stressed. I'm like, I know that I have work and I've never once been without work, but any freelancer or business owner will know you stress about not having any work soon. You're like, surely it's going to dry up. Like I don't have anything locked in for later. Yeah, so I didn't want to have these people that I was responsible for, um, especially when I hit those quiet patches because that's what happens. So I decided to, yeah, handpick a few of these freelance writers and build a bit of a remote team. And that also helped even with things like they weren't working in the office with me. So cuts down on costs there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it meant that like whenever we had a project come through the door, we would figure out who the best person for the job would be. So I'd really handpicked people based on their writing style or their experience in a certain industry or maybe they were great at a certain type of copywriting. Um, and so we would just reach out to them and they would say yes or no. And we kind of just built it up from there. Um, and obviously, like anything, over time, people have moved overseas. New people have come on board. Like it's pretty fluid. But it means that we've got this team. There's probably about like 10 writers, I think, that we use quite often. Um, and then I've just hired another two. We've got like, or in total, there's now four of us in-house, like as employees. Um, and the rest are freelance. So those two, two of those employees have only just hired, um, like they haven't even started yet. So it's something that's new because I wasn't sure whether, again, that was the path I wanted to go down. But mm. I think I've, I love the idea of having a small team with me and yeah. then having lots of freelancers as well. 
Yeah. And I love that too, the idea of, um, you know, because I think so many people go into business and they do really try and define themselves and their brand. But then when it comes to business structure, they go, oh, well, I have to have an office. I have to have a team. Yes. I have to do this. Yeah. So I love that. Actually, know what's right for me. Yeah. And what's like a creative way of doing everything. So rather than just automatically saying, oh, it's now time to hire staff, taking a step back and being like, actually, is that the best decision for me? Not only for finances, but also for my brand. Um, And then I just slap a fun name on everything. So (laughs) (laughs) do you have a process for, for the thought process or is it just, that's just a a step back um, think about not straight. really in terms of making decisions I'm a huge anxious person massive overthinker yeah like <laughs> if you ask any of my friends or my husband it will take me like weeks to decide on a chocolate bar <laughs> so even the thought of like making a big grown-up decision oh my god it's like that's probably one thing that I don't like is that I feel a little bit isolated when I have to make big decisions just Mm -hmm. because I'm so indecisive. Um, So I think because I leave so much time, I'm going through pros and cons. Like there's a lot of time to think about a creative way of doing it. (laughs) Well, maybe the lesson is give yourself the space to have time. Yeah. And just just rushing into things. Exactly. And think about it, like journal, write notes down. Like I'd love to visualize the different options that I'm going through. And I feel sometimes it's a pain in the ass because I'll either miss the opportunity or I like am just in turmoil because I can't decide. But also it's good because generally it means that I will make the right decision because I've thought about it so much. Mm. No, I love that. I think that that's a really good approach. Um, I think we have this immediacy problem at the moment where everything's, everything's urgent. There's a client always yelling in your inbox. There's DMs in every freaking platform to reply to. I feel like you feel like you've got to just make decisions. So kind of giving yourself a little bit of creative space is probably really good advice. Yeah. I think any space is good. And I totally get like not having the time, like you have to make decisions quickly. And sometimes I just wish I could make a decision. Like my best friend who I share the office with, we're pole opposite and she can make a decision, like snap decisions. So yeah. I'm like, I'm going to need like a month to talk about this. <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing. Good balance though. Yeah. Very good balance, but also good to have someone that's decisive to make my decisions for me. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. I love that. So obviously um, things have grown over the years and you've evolved from blog, freelance writing to all the way through full-fledged copywriting agency, small team, freelancers, amazing. Um, So through that time, you would have had to get clients. Um, And obviously with the program, get customers. So how have you found that? So how has like sales and marketing been for you in the business have you kind of found any ways that work for you yeah I would say probably my biggest game changer was just when I stopped caring what other people think and I just did whatever am I allowed to swear on here oh fuck yeah (laughs) (laughs) whatever the fuck I wanted (laughs) so I feel like in the beginning even I was trying to please everybody Mm. Um, and I've talked about this a lot, but it really is like the number one thing. And I was trying to make it look like everybody would like it. I was trying to make it sound like mm. everybody would like it. I was trying to attract everyone. And then I think when I niched down into having that really bold, like for example, even with my design, I did lots of research in the beginning and I noticed that so this was back in 2016 but I noticed that there were so many copywriters and copywriting studios that were like confetti and baby pink. Like that was just Mm. the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there was the really traditional dated stuffy agencies. So I thought, all right, neither of those are my vibe. I'm just going to go right in the middle and I'm going to make everything super attention grabbing in your face, bold, bright colors Um, And it wasn't really like that in the beginning, but I've just kind of like made it like that over time. And then I think really just framing it around my personality and even like my Instagram 
captions, people will say, oh, I can feel you like reading the caption to yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're texting it to me. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think a combination of those things and just trying to do like everything different to my industry. Like what does every other copywriter do? Okay, I'm going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. um, so that has really, really helped. In terms of like clients, my strategy has always been nail the project, nail one project yeah. and they will be back and they will tell uh, their friends. Yeah. So it's definitely been more of a word of mouth situation in terms of the client side. Nice. Um, and I have some pretty great SEO as well that helps. Yeah. How have you done that? I did it myself. I'm definitely not an SEO expert. I had a meeting with someone I used to work with at my co-working space and said, tell me all the secrets. Yeah. And he basically just said to research words, which I did. I think I just used like free tools. And then I went through and put them all through my website. But then I also, I didn't realize this at the time that SEO was beyond words. It was also like your um, user experience and that sort of thing so I got my design changed a little bit and I actually didn't know whether it was good or not but it definitely works and then I spoke to an SEO person and they said they put me in some sort of platform and it came up that it was really good <laughs> <laughs> amazing well yeah. and it's really interesting because I um I'm a huge SEO believer yeah. um, and I've probably taken more of a content approach more like a, how much content like blog content consistent over time um, and I'm such a it takes so long like you, everything you talked about is very much um, you know optimization like yeah. research all that kind of stuff and then I think the kind of second layer to that is consistently putting out content so that the Google gods love you 100%. and kind of serve you up so I always say to people with SEO just start now now because yeah. it takes time yeah it's not an overnight thing mm -hmm. um but I think in terms of just yeah coming out with a bang really using your own personality if you mm -hmm. are the face of your business that is um I feel like those things were big game changers for me and then when I started the course and the programs that really allowed me to tap into a whole nother side yeah um because it was people that were just starting out or people that were not yet able to hire an agency. So while yeah. this whole time I had been trying to get these big clients, I didn't have anything for these other people that were emailing me constantly and then they couldn't afford it because okay. they were in the same spot that I was and they just had a million other things to buy. So I feel like that has really helped with income and not income, well, income too, but like sales and marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And I love that too, because it's like, that's just listening to your customers, right? So, you know, yeah. you kind of go into market thinking, well, this is what I do. But over time, as you've had client phone calls, all of those things, you've got, okay, what's the missing piece? Like, what is everybody saying that I might not be solving at the moment? And then plugging something in. Yeah. And that. just taking note of like, you know, I would be getting emails from, they were all, you know, about 22, 23, they were starting a beauty business. And I just looked for patterns mm. whenever there was like, and I kept track of any clients that I'd lost and I'd written down like why we lost them. Awesome. Um, and I would just look for those patterns. And then obviously things like the free masterclasses that I'm doing, even the copy camp one that's coming up, that is completely free. And everyone that has signed up is the sort of people that are just starting a business or they're a freelance copywriter who's just starting out so yeah I feel like you're able to serve those people in a different way yeah and it's really interesting too because I think people get worried about doing things for free but in actual fact delivering value to people that might not be quite there yet those people don't forget like if you help them on their journey when they are at the stage that they can afford your services you're their go-to Exactly. I, I don't know if it's maybe like the writer in me because I've written so much for free that I'm just like, what's the big deal? Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> just tell everyone. Totally, totally. And I think that's the, that's the thing as well is like, there's not, um, you know, there are infinite resources. It's not like if you give away a free workshop or a cheat sheet or a, even a mini course or something, it's not like you've given away all your ideas and all your potential customers have yeah. gotten your stuff for free. Like there's plenty out there and there's plenty yeah. of people that will value the paid work as well. Exactly. And it's just, like I said, another type of audience, like you're going to mm. get 
um, more followers or you're going to get engagement or they might purchase from you one day or yeah they might work with you down the track when they can afford it so I feel like or even just mention you to somebody exactly their friend is like I'm really struggling with copywriting like oh I follow this girl she's amazing yeah yeah the amount of people that follow bossy that are not like they're not probably never going to be bossy clients, mm. but I know that they support everything that bossy does. They're always like listening to the podcast or listening, listening to the workshops or whatever it might be. And I know that they talk to their friends. So yeah. yeah. And it's just a good way to give back. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's, it's a nice balance between, yes, I'm trying to build my sales funnel because I need money over time, but there's so much opportunity out there just to share and engage with potential people who are coming up through the ranks. Exactly. And it's too hard. I feel like trying to DIY everything yourself, like mm-hmm. the amount of nights that I have spent like fighting with my laptop, trying to figure out even like SEO or something like that. Yeah. So to have like a few different people that you can go to for inspiration or knowledge or tips or whatever it might be. Like, I don't really think I had anyone like that to turn to when I started bossy yeah really a thing I don't know yeah no I love it I love it so tell me then um because you know I feel like you've got it all figured out but I feel like it might not have always been like that <laughs> I definitely do <laughs> not <babe. laughs> that worries you're coming across that way uh but what's been like a big challenge to date so um you know I think it's easy especially like so if I look at your Instagram I go you know you know who you are you've nailed your brand you give a lot of value as an outsider looking in it does really look like you know you've got it all figured out but I know because I'm a business owner that that is sometimes the the stuff we put out there have there been any big challenges you have found over the years and how you might have overcome them Mm, yeah a couple I think the big one for me is just and I'm still figuring it out just the weight of owning a business and carrying that every single day And I actually just read someone else posting this on Instagram before I came on here. Um, But I feel like it is just so consuming. Like I literally cannot switch off. Um, So it definitely does have a big effect, I think, on my mental health because Mm -hmm. I just can't escape it. Like I'm constantly thinking, I'm thinking of ideas in my sleep. And I'm like, remember when you just used to go to your retail job at five o'clock and then you would go home and sit on the couch? Oh my God, take me back, take me back. (laughs) Take me back there. Um, No, like wouldn't change it for the world, but it is really, really challenging. Like I definitely do have big ups and downs um, and cry a lot. Do you have a strategy for dealing with that? Um, I just kind of like ride the wave, but then I also like, no, I'm, I'm pretty in tune with how I'm feeling. So if I'm having, like, if I'm in a rut and I'm feeling really unmotivated, or if I'm just feeling a bit flat and nothing's like cheering me up, I feel like I just try and take a step back and I'm pretty good at like prioritizing other stuff. So being like, okay, I'm probably not in the right frame of mind to be working on this all day, but what do I love to do? I love taking my laptop and sitting at a cafe and buying lunch and thinking of like a new idea or planning out, you know, what I want to do next. Mm. And then that kind of gives me another burst of motivation, I think. Um, So yeah, I definitely feel like that just the pressure of, and not even like, the pressure of paying, you know, staff or the pressure Mm. of not knowing if it's going to work or anything like that. It's more so just, it's just constantly on my mind. So it's just a lot to carry. Um, But I guess the other thing for me that has been a challenge that paid off was when I launched the course for the first time, I was shitting myself. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Like I was so scared because when I launched it, I hadn't actually made the course, which was the strategy that I was following. So I came out. That's very cool. I love that. And very bold. I came out and I said, and I, yeah, so I'm in a program and I know you've spoken to Stevie Dillon recently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So yeah. She's kind of taught me the course world, but I feel like just taking the leap and 
selling something before you've actually created it is yeah. so terrifying. And then when people actually buy it and you're like, oh no, I have to. Actually- oh shit, I've got to show up now. Damn it. <laughs> and I think especially for me, I was so terrified because I don't know how to teach. Well, I didn't know. I thought how to teach people how to write because it's Mm. such a personal thing. Um, So that was definitely by far the biggest, scariest thing I've done since starting Bossy. Um, And it eventually paid off. But yeah, just going out there and putting myself out there and selling something that I hadn't made, not knowing that if people were going to buy it, um and just even doing like the live webinars like that did not that was not a thing for me and I just had to do it anyway so now I'm in the flow um but it was just a bit more of a risk one that I'm glad I took but it was definitely a challenge for me I mean I love this because so um and we have I guess different kinds of businesses but I in the past have actually spent a lot of money on developing and creating things first yeah. and then trying to sell them and they potentially not the idea not paying off mm-hmm. so, um, so right now my philosophy and it has been for the last few years is I will not launch anything without having sold it first so yeah. I actually love that approach because it actually as scary as it is it kind of helps weed out the bad ideas really really quickly like if people yeah. aren't going to pay you for the value you're telling them you're going to give them they're not going to pay you when it's done and you're telling them the exact same amount of value that you're giving them so exactly. the fact that you can kind of go out there sell it first and then go oh my god people are into this and then create it I yeah. literally think more people People need to know about that. I agree. Yeah, that's why I said it paid off because in the beginning I was like, this is crazy. I'm not doing yeah. this. <laughs> like I would rather spend all year working on this thing and then it doesn't work. But I was just like, no, trust the process. Yep. Just do it and see what happens. Um, so I started with a foundation round and I just came out and I said, this is what I'm selling. Um, you're going to learn this, this and this. And that sold out in like 24 hours. So I was like, wow. okay, there's obviously a bit of a demand. So it kind of validated my idea. And then when it came to my bigger launch later in the year, um, even that whole process, like it was exhausting, mm. but it was definitely an amazing learning curve. And I feel like if I didn't do something big like that, like I usually try and do something big every year, whether it's the podcast or whether it's the course, yeah. Um, I feel like if I don't do something like that, it like I feel really inspired and motivated when I've got an extra project to work yes. on. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I would just get really complacent and the time would tick by. So I feel like it was scary, but it was worth it. I actually love that though, because I feel like those big kind of pressure moments of I'm launching something bigger, inspirational, brand new are the things that make you feel like you're progressing really far in business. Like there are these underlying always on things that we do, but the course, the, you know, whether it's a book, whether it's an event, whether it's a whatever, like those kind of pockets are the things that kind of help you build assets in your business that will Mm -hmm. be there then forever um, that help progress you ongoing. Yeah, I agree. And it's kind of like changed the shape of Bossy. Like I started Bossy because I wanted to have, more freedom but then I didn't really have any freedom I'm like sitting at my desk for 15 hours every day and I'm like what's going on this is not what I signed up for like hmm something went something (laughs) Something went awry there (laughs) yeah whereas the course I'm like that's my next thing I want to just see how it goes yeah and it was scary but because it worked that just gave me like a shot of adrenaline and got me so excited for what my business and my life could look like in the next couple of years. Mm. So just doing that one scary thing, I feel like has set Bossy up for the next few years, if that makes sense. That's so cool. And are you doing it as um, like a launch model or an evergreen model? Both. So um, I'm having like a couple of launches a year. So I think when I did it in December, that was for my class of 2022. Yeah. But then the one that I have coming up now, which I'm using 
like copy camp to lead into that and kind mm. of giving, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of information. But then if people want more, they have the chance to enroll in the course straight after it's finished. Nice. Um, so that will be like my mid-year intake, but then people can enroll throughout the year as well. And then what I'm planning to do and what I did for my mini program that I launched in May, that was called Caption Coach. So that was essentially like an express course in mm -hmm. captions specifically. And then I think I would like to do them for all the different elements. Like I think there needs to be like a website copy one and needs to be an email flow one. So just really like if people have a good handle on their tone of voice, they don't need the entire degree, which teaches them to come up with their voice and write all of their copy. Like yeah. Rossi, if they just want their website copy and they can't hire someone to do it, because it can still cost thousands of dollars to do that. Mm. Um, they can DIY it, but it's through like an express course. So I've got lots of ideas. <laughs> oh my God. I know. I'm like, I've literally, so since you've been talking, I've written an entire post-it <laughs> note of ideas because I'm like, oh God, I've got to do that. And I've got to do that. And I've got to do that. It's why I can't sleep at night because I'm freaking oh thinking God. of things in my sleep. Oh my God. Totally. Tell me about it. Well, on that topic. So um, you mentioned, you know, in the moments where you're like not feeling it, you can take yeah. yourself out to lunch and do more of the creative stuff you like. Do you have any other strategies in terms of looking after yourself as a business owner? Yeah. Well, like I said, I feel like I am pretty good at well, relatively good at work-life balance. Like obviously I work tons mm -hmm. um but at the same time I really really try and prioritize other stuff because I just don't want to be that person that's working all the time yeah so I definitely hang out with my friends a lot um I love just even going to Pilates Pilates is such a good one because I feel like it's so good for your mental health yeah um and it sets me up for the day I love going to see bands. I love going to restaurants. So weekends for me, even though I might work, like at the moment I'm working a lot on the weekend because I'm preparing for copy camp. Mm. Um, but generally I'll try not to work too much on the weekend. And then I feel like I've at least had a bit of a rest because I feel like even though it might not sound like much, if I'm doing that, I'm at least feeling like I'm living my life and not just sitting at my desk. <laughs> No, it's so true though, right? Like, cause I think, you know, you kind of hit the nail on the head before, like we all start businesses because we want freedom and flexibility in our life only to have a business and realize we have no freedom and flexibility. So exactly. actually baking that in and going, what do I love? I love going out. I love seeing my friends. I love seeing bands. I love to eat good food. Like going, I need to consciously make that a part of my life and not feel guilty that I'm not at my laptop I yeah, that's that the thing. other thing. The feeling guilty. I feel so guilty as oh, I'm God, sure everybody yeah. does. Mm. Um, but even the, the two new girls that I've recently hired, that was like a huge leap for me. And that was probably for the most part in order for me to get to that freedom goal. Because yeah. I feel like, yes, there's heaps to do and I could probably get through it myself. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm just going to take the leap because they're both amazing and I don't want to lose them. And I feel like that's going to help me get 90% of stuff off my plate. Mm -hmm. So I can focus on the core side of the business yep. mostly, but I can also go to Europe for a couple of weeks if I want. <laughs> oh my God, the dream. <laughs> the dream. <laughs> Oh, that is so good. Um, yeah. Okay, well, let's wrap with, so um, the people listening into this podcast are usually early stage female founders or aspiring female founders. So people who are kind of just hoping to try and take the leap. Yeah. Would there be any advice you have to new business owners um, that perhaps you wish you had have heard when you first started? Mm. I feel like it sounds so cheesy, but I feel like most of us don't take the leap purely to do anything, whether that's start a business or whether that's contact a, a dream client or whatever it might be. Mm. Um, I feel like it all comes back to being a scaredy cat, <laughs> which is me. Yes. <laughs> so I feel like I always try and remember, like even before I did the course, I was like, if I spent, what if I spend months doing this and it doesn't work? Like what mm -hmm. if nobody buys it? So I always try and ask myself, even though it's really cheesy, 
what would you do if you knew it couldn't fail? Like if you knew mm. it was going to work, you would 100% do it. So yes. why wouldn't you just do it anyway? And yeah. if you want to be like practical about it, I, I'm i like, a, I'm definitely a risk-taking person in my life. But for some reason in business, I'm just like a little bit more nervous, a little bit more risk averse. So the way I did it was obviously had my day job in inverted commas to fall back on Mm. and then slowly started to reduce that once Bossy was picking up a little bit. I found that was like a good way to have a safety net, make sure I could pay my bills until I knew that it was going to work. But yeah, try not. I think a lot of people, including me, we really let perfectionism hold us back so like Mm -hmm. waiting till everything's perfect waiting till all your ducks are in a row when sometimes you should just get out there and sell something before you've made it (laughs) oh my god I love it so much because the funniest thing that I have found is the more perfect I try and make something the less it works people people actually love being on the journey with you Mm -hmm. and sometimes your first thoughts are the best thoughts like because it's the most authentic the most just hard hitting value solving versus trying to perfect it, trying to perfect it. And then it loses something in that process. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I just, yeah. I just think that is the best advice ever. And I love like, you know, sometimes you see the, you know, quote tiles on Instagram. Yeah. That's like, take the leap, do the thing. But I love that you said it's okay to dip a toe in the water, just as long as you're, and have the safety net, as long as you are moving something forward. So if you do yeah, have yeah. a dream to start a business or do anything, it doesn't have to be a business. You can keep the safety net, but you can also dedicate time every day to achieving that goal. Yeah. And if you want it to work, you'll find the time somewhere, Mm -hmm. Uh, even if it means you have to sacrifice something, um, you will make it happen if you really want it. Yeah. So yeah, I feel like often we'll try and find a way. I'm like Mrs. Procrastinate. We always try and find a way to procrastinate or um, we let our perfectionism hold us back. And it's at the end of the day, we're just self-sabotaging. So Mm. I feel like maybe if you're feeling like that, you might not have cracked that one feeling that you get when you have that amazing idea or you found your niche. It's something, And that's why I feel like once you find something that really lights you up and you feel like really aligns with your personality, a lot of the time you'll be like jumping out of bed to build it because you're just so excited to make it work. Oh my God. Or like that moment where the first person pays you, but yes. you're like, Oh my God, I can make money from this thing. Yeah. And I don't have to do the other thing. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, once you see the results, it's a little bit more motivating. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you are incredible, Elise. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today and sharing your wisdom and your journey um, with the Spark community. I could not be more grateful. Cheers to you. Thanks for having a little virtual vino. My pleasure. It was so nice to be here. I had the best time ever.